So my name is Sanaj from the University of Miami. I'm going to talk about the integration of molecular markers and MRI. We've heard a lot about both of these today, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit how you bring them together. So I think uh, one of your disclosures, I am a scientific investigator and guest lecturer for OPCO, which uh, brings the 4K score, and I use a lot of MRI in my practice. And I think one of the things that we can all feel uh, certain about at this conference is that, you know, it's very exciting to see all the technology that we've seen in prostate cancer. But whenever we talk about prostate cancer screening with men, most of them go right back to thinking about all the barbaric kind of things that we want to do with, uh, with them. Now, when we talk about biomarkers, I mean, we can't ignore, obviously, the impact of PSA and what that's done in terms of changing the type of prostate cancers that we see, because it's taken cancer that we rarely found early enough to do anything curative for to a type of cancer that we find so early nowadays that we don't even know what to do with it. So it's clearly had a big impact. And what we see, and Andrew showed a lot of these slides yesterday, uh, so I'm not going to go into them. And we also have a number of screening trials that shows that a PSA screening does actually reduce mortality and saves lives, but we know that it has a big problem with overdetection. So we see a lot of men that are being subjected to unnecessary biopsies, and that subsequently leads to a lot of problems with overtreatment. And I think we've gotten better in this area, but there is a big push to try not to diagnose these types of cancers that we know we're going to be following, and I think that's where these, you know, tools in terms of MRI and biomarkers are coming into the space. So when we think about, as uh, Preston mentioned, there's been much more of a push towards moving from sensitivities to specificity, and I think, you know, the PSA is not going to be the type of tool that's going to help us distinguish these types of cancers from these types of cancers, and that's what we're hoping that things like an MRI and the biomarker is going to be able to do. So the problem that we have is, and it's a good problem, I guess, to have, is we have so many of these tools to try and figure out which one we want to use that it can be often difficult to know what's the best way to start. And so I'm going to try to talk a little bit about that today. So we've heard a lot about multiparametric MRI. Obviously, we're going to hear more about it tomorrow as well. And this is probably one of the landmark papers in this area that randomized guys to either going to a trust biopsy if they had an elevated PSA, or they would get the MRI and then go on a biopsy if it was positive. So we saw that this trial led to a huge reduction in the number of biopsies that would be performed. And in the end, when you looked at it, no matter how you look at the data, uh, the MRI targeted group had a higher in, um, incidence of high-grade cancer compared to the standard biopsy group and a lower rate of indolent cancer. And those are the type of metrics that we want to see. So it kind of really pushed, you know, the, the field to say that maybe this should be what we are doing. Um, the problem, however, is when you look at the PROMISE trial, and we heard a little bit about that as well, and Preston mentioned it just now as well, is we know that a negative MRI doesn't mean you don't have cancer. Because PROMISE, you know, looked at 4 plus 3 as their, their main endpoint, and when you had a low risk or PIRADS 1 or 2, 11% of these guys had a significant cancer. Cancer, And when you look at PIRADS-3, it's up to 20% of these. And there was a, a meta-analysis looking at this whole concept of negative predictive value, and what they found is it ranges somewhere between about 70 to 90%. So with the best radiologists that we have, we're still missing about 10 to 30% of cancers. Now, a lot of these are not going to be the very lethal, high-grade, high-volume ones, but a lot of these are the 3 plus 4s that we would at least want to know about. And so that, that does present a problem in terms of MRI in this space. Now, we have a lot of these markers that have become available, and each of them have good studies that suggest that they can reduce the number of biopsies that we do, and it can help us detect these cancers earlier. But again, we have an issue in terms of knowing which is the best one to go for um, and how well it's going to work for us. So my goal here was really to see, do MRI and biomarkers have a complementary role in prostate cancer detection? We've seen a lot more papers coming out in that area, and if possible, to try and talk a little bit about what's the most effective sequencing of these two tools. So we did a study looking at about 150 guys that underwent a 4K score, an MRI, and a biopsy, and about 33% of them had Gleason 7 or higher cancer. And this is just a raw plot of the data. You can see the 4K score here on the y-axis. This is their MRI PIRAD score here on the x-axis, and this is the color code just kind of uh, tells you what kind of the cancer they ended up having here. And what we found is that guys that had a high suspicion MRI, PIRADS 4 or 5, had a higher 4K score than guys that had a low suspicion uh, MRI, which is what we'd expect. And if you use the MRI and the 4K score together, your AUC was about 0.82 compared to 0.75 and 0.70 for using either test alone. So it did appear that using the two together was complementary. And when we looked at it, we found that this is guys with a PIRADS 1 to 3 MRI. These are guys with a PIRADS 4 MRI. And you can see that the MRI really did set the stage for their risk, and the 4K score kind of provided a more granular assessment of that risk along the spectrum. Now, we, we try to, to look at this again in more of a multi-institutional setting. So we had about five sites, 407 men that were involved in this. All of them had an MRI, a 4K score, and a biopsy. And again, we had about 30% of guys that had the Gleason 7 or higher cancer. And what we wanted to look at is, what if you just used one test alone? What were the metrics you got compared to using both tests? So in this first strategy, if you used, let's say, just a 4K score, and we used a cutoff of 7.5%, 
So if you were less than that, you didn't get the biopsy. If you were higher, you got the biopsy. And you would reduce about a quarter of the biopsies you do. And out of these 407 men, or, uh, we, 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 uh, you, you have about eight that do ahead with an undetected uh, Gleason 7 or higher cancer. Now, if you did the MRI, and basically if it's pyrads 1 to 3, you don't do the biopsy. For 4 or 5, you did. Again, you reduced about the same number of biopsies and, and did have some guys that ended up having missed cancers. But the majority of the cancers that we missed, I mean, the Gleason 4 plus 3s, 4 4s, and stuff like that were, were not the majority. Most of them were the 3 plus 4s that we missed in both of these strategies. Now, if you looked at using both tests, so in this situation, you would do uh, the first test, and if it was low risk, you didn't do the biopsy. If it was high risk, because we do know that, there, there, for example, if an MRI, if you see a pyrides 4 or 5, you're going to do the biopsy. And even if uh, you have a biomarker that's very high, an MRI that's negative may not change that view. So if it was high risk, the plan was to do the biopsy. And if it's in the, bit, in the middle somewhere, that's where you use the second test. So if you looked at doing a 4K score first, and again here, if it became like 7.5 to 30 percent, that's when you got the MRI and do the biopsy if it's high risk you reduced about 40% of the biopsies you did. If you did it the other way around, you did the MRI first and then did the 4K, if it's a PIRADS 3, about 40% as well. Again, you do miss some unde uh, undetected GG2 plus cancers, but the majority of them still were in the Gleason 3 plus 4 range, not the more lethal ones. So a big jump in the number of biopsies you reduce, though, by doing both tests instead of each one by itself. So um, that did kind of push towards some more evidence suggesting that both of these do have a complementary role together. This is Ash Tiwari's data from the group at Mount Sinai, and they did something very similar in their group of patients. I think it was just over 250 patients. And they looked at a strategy where if you just did a 4K score test, and then did an MRI if the 4K score was above 7.5%, um, or if, um, yeah, if it was above 7.5%, and they would do the biopsy if the MRI was positive, or if the 4K was above 18%. And you can see here that they avoided about 30% of the biopsies, and about 2.7% of clinically significant cancers were missed. They looked at another strategy where they did the MRI, and then they do a 4K if the MRI was negative, and again, you reduce about a quarter, 2.7% of cancers missed, and the same thing they saw with PSA density. And then they did a decision and curve analysis, and they found that the actual highest net benefit was if you did this strategy here, where you did a 4K score test first, and then the MRI if it's positive. So I think that's kind of the way that this group has kind of been pushing things. So when you're trying to figure out, you know, in terms of which one you're going to go first, whether you go the MRI or whether you go the, the biomarker, and there's a lot of debate about this, I mean, there's pros and cons on both sides. Obviously, from a biomarker standpoint, there's lots of evidence suggesting that these markers have good accuracy for prostate cancer detection. Access shouldn't be an issue because you should be able to go to any lab and get them done. They're non-invasive. They're either urine tests or blood tests, and they're going to provide you an objective measure of risk because we know that MRI can be very subjective. The downside is there is a cost to it. Uh, there is some uncertainty as to which biomarker to use. All the studies suggest that each one of them works very well. Um, you're not going to get much information that's helpful for targeting, obviously, like an MRI would. And then the other issue is the validation and generalizability. I mean, some of these markers have lots of different studies in lots of different populations. Others don't. Uh, and then also is the cutoffs that markers that are using, are they the best cutoffs that are out there? You know, and we don't know that yet. Um, from the MRI standpoint, obviously the pro is that you get good accuracy still for detection clinically significant disease. It's going to be helpful for targeting because if you see something, you can actually aim at it on the biopsy. And it does appear to trump other things, other markers when it's positive. But the negative predictive value is an issue. We still miss cancers when the MRI is negative. Access and cost is a big problem, and reader variability obviously is a huge problem. So from a very simplistic standpoint, and I think Preston also kind of mentioned this, if you're in a place where you're in a specialized tertiary care center and you have a very good radiologist, your MRI may be the first go-to that you're going to do. But if you're in a place where access is a problem and you can't get an MRI very easy, or you don't have a radiologist that you have a lot of faith in, then you may go to the biomarker. And if the biomarker is what you're going to use, then you have the problem of deciding which one you're going to go. I mean, I love Oreo cookies. I never pass a plate by. I'll grab one. But if I get this in front of me, I have absolutely no idea which one I want. And that's kind of the issue that we see with a lot of the biomarkers, I think, today in terms of not knowing which is the, the best, because we don't have good trials with head-to-head -head comparison of them to know which one's going to have the most efficacy for the best cost. So a little of something new that we've heard a lot about AI here today, and we've been playing in this space as well, and uh, one of our, uh, my uh, colleagues, Radka Stoyanova, has built this automated software called the Habitat Risk Score, and essentially it reads the MRI using the DWI and uh, DCE uh, sequences, and it applies a Habitat Risk Score to various regions of the prostate based on those two sequences and higher scores for the, oh, sorry. Well, higher scores pretty much denote uh, higher chances of risk. And we looked at this in our radical prostatectomy patients, 
and compared it to our, uh, our MRI reads, and we actually found that this did a better job picking out Gleason 7 or higher cancers. And we've also looked at this in our active surveillance patients. We have a trial where guys are getting MRIs and biopsies every year, and we, we can see that, you know, on the baseline MRI, uh, we didn't identify this area that was found in the top, and the HRS did, and then on subsequent MRIs it started to grow, and we eventually found this, but we would have found it a lot earlier using this software. So we've now been awarded, myself, Dr. Pollock, and Dr. Stoyanova have been awarded a, a U01 grant to kind of look at this in the actual uh, prostate cancer detection space. So the idea here is, you know, patients will be enrolled in this. We're looking at 250 patients that we're trying to get into this trial. They'll have a blood test, they'll have a urine test, and then they'll get an MRI done as well. And the MRI will be read by our radiologist and assigned to PIRADS, but at the same time, it'll also have a, um, a HRS assessment as well. And then we're going to actually do the biopsies based on any PIRADS three or five lesions that we see and any HRS six or higher lesions, because that was the number that kind of had the best uh, indication of Gleason 7 or higher cancer. And then um, essentially the first 150 patients that we're going to be enrolling in this, because we do know that there are certain metrics this is, you know, that we can do to improve the system. Um, so we're going to have the first 150, but essentially we're going to look and track the biopsies that, that we're taking on these patients and figure out exactly where the biopsies went on the MRI, look at the pathology from those areas, and, we, and Dr. Stoyanova has kind of created this radiomic pipeline which will allow us to extract some of the key variables we're looking at to see if we can incorporate it into this HRS to kind of recalibrate and refine it. We're also going to be looking at the genomics that we get from some of these biopsies and again try to train the system to look for areas not just of high pathology but high genomic risk. And then in the remaining 100 patients we're going to validate um, that and use the newer refined HRS to kind of target the biopsies. And I think it's a great opportunity, I was telling some of the guys here, that you know, we would eventually try to push this into more of a multi-center trial. So if there's guys that are doing a lot of this and want to partner with this, I think it's a great opportunity to show that this is something that's more generalizable and can actually be applied in this space. So the anticipated clinical workflow that we are hoping to get out of this, if you have a guy that's coming with an elevated PSA and or abnormal DRE, um, typically we would get a standard of care MRI, read it by PIRADS, and if you look at the PROMISE study, the negative predictive value for a Gleason 7 or higher cancer is roughly around 70% based on that study. Now, our goal is, to, now that you could say that that is probably not good enough for a guy to say I'm going to avoid a biopsy because there's still a risk that he may be missing something. Our thought is if we add the HRS to that, obviously if the, uh, biop if the HRS or the MRI shows something, we're going to do the biopsy. If it doesn't, then the thought is we can improve that negative predictive value to about 80%, 84%. Now, then we would go to the biomarker. If that shows something, we would do the biopsy. If it doesn't, then the thought is we can get a negative predictive value that's above 90%. And that is kind of the, the power analysis we did for this and, and is much more, I think, acceptable to a guy to say that I'm going to safely avoid the biopsy and not worry that he's got a big risk of missing a significant cancer. And that's kind of the, the trial that we've been funded to do. So ultimately, you know, the way we're doing things, we do the PSA screening, we're looking for biopsy candidates based on screening. But I think the idea of we're moving forward here is to using a secondary biomarker to really figure out which of these guys need a biopsy and kind of save it in the guys that don't really need one. So to conclude, I do think that MRI and biomarkers can work synergistically together to improve our cancer detection. The right sequence, I think, is still unclear. We need prospective trials with more head-to-head -head comparison of biomarkers to really know which is the right one to start with and which is the best marker in that space. And I think that's where the field is, is needing to be pushed. And I know we have a lot of companies that are here today, and as I mentioned, on this particular trial, we are collecting post-DRE urine, we're collecting blood, so I think it's a wonderful opportunity to say, if you guys want to get involved in that, to kind of look at your assay and see how well it performs in this as well uh, compared to the MRI. Thank you.